in 2013 <laughs> is when I came up to visit you, which is what you were talking about earlier, was me yeah. tooling around uh, Brainerd, Minnesota on my, my Brompton and going, you know, this, it isn't great, but it isn't bad. And part yeah. of what makes many of these cities and towns not bad, they're not great, but they're not bad for getting around on bike and, and by walking, is that in reality, except for that strode, there's nobody around. There's not that many cars. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, that's the that's the that's the astounding thing is that we have put so much of our wealth right. into frictionless movement of motor vehicles. And you know, ob obsessively so, like oh there's a there's a 30 second delay someone experienced on the other side of town at one point. We need 9 million dollars and literally like this is what yeah. we're talking about. Um there's no cars, right? Uh, and, and and this was a this was a cognitive dissonance thing for me too because I grew up here. I grew up in a a car culture. I grew up. I I, I passed my driver's test on my 16th birthday. I saved up and bought myself a car. Uh, I, I I did an interview a, a while back and they asked me about growing up here and I said, you know, I. I needed a car because I wanted a girlfriend. And that was, you know, those two things were synonymous at right. that point because a car meant, you know, mobility, you get around. I, I have, I'm not an anti-car person, but stepping back and looking at uh, the, the way we have essentially given up so much of our wealth, so much of our prosperity, so much of the quality of life and experience that that is good in this neighborhood um, so that we can have high speed frictionless right. traffic that would be ridiculous enough if every if there was tons of traffic but when you take it the next step further and realize that like a really busy street will have one car every three or four minutes go by right it, it becomes like a pathology it's at some point you step back and recognize that that there's there's something almost pathological in our analysis of our environment that has prompted us to do this. And I can't, the human psychological part, I struggle to even grasp and understand. Yeah, yeah. So you've written two books now. Yeah. And uh, the most recent book that you wrote was Confessions of a Recovering Engineer. Uh, talk, give us... Give us the, the, the elevator pitch as to why you wrote this book and uh, and what it's all about. Yeah, I actually am working on the third book right now. There's five books in this series that I pitched to Wiley Publishing. And I feel like it was a little bit, and I'm not comparing myself to George Lucas, but I feel it was a little bit like George Lucas when he had like this vision for how six Star Wars movies should go. And the studio's like, yeah, okay, this is crazy. Give us one. Uh, that was Strong Towns. That was the first one. Um, but but if you go through Strong Towns, a lot of people are disappointed because you didn't talk about Strohs. You didn't talk about uh, any of the transportation stuff. And Confessions is that. Um, it's this hyper focus on the transportation issues as they intersect with Strong Towns. Um, I use as a device for this book, the city of Springfield, Massachusetts, because uh, I had the, the the good fortune, the bad fortune. I, I you know, it, it was a tragedy of being in the city at the time this this tragedy occurred. This uh, strode through the middle of the city. Uh, I had gone out and looked at that day with some local activists, some people who wanted to see it it fixed. The city had just redid the street, State Street in Springfield. Uh, in a way that made it obviously like really, really dangerous. I mean, you could stand there and observe people almost getting hit. And 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 not. I'm not saying I like incidentally observed it. I said we stood there for 10 minutes and watched multiple occurrences of this. And so uh, that night, uh, a, a mother, a daughter, and a niece, uh, two little girls with a adult were walking here and, and were struck. Uh, the little niece was injured horribly. Uh, and the little girl was killed. And I was there. And, you know, I, 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 I've said many times, this type of tragedy is hor horrific. It's, it's, it's difficult to contemplate and deal with. Um, but understand that this happens 10 times a day. I mean, there's over 3,000 kids a year that are killed on our streets. I just happened to be in one place where it happened. And 
because of the egregiousness of this design mixed with this particular tragedy, uh, I've been spent many years now pushing on trying to get this street fixed. There's a lot of people there in Springfield who were pushing on this. Uh, there ultimately became a, a, a city council that wanted to see this changed. Uh, but the, the the bureaucracy of transportation from street design standards uh, to state encumbrances to how we deal with congestion, all of this prevented positive action from happening that would prevent further loss of life. And in fact, further loss of life happened. It continued to happen year after year after year. People would get hit. People would get killed on this exact street. Um, and so this book um, it is an attempt to explain to everybody in North America why their transportation system isn't working. Uh, whether your concern is delays and congestion for automobile drivers, whether your concern is being able to bike and walk, whether your concern is my city has no budget to maintain their roads and my taxes are going up and my roads are falling apart. Wherever you fall on that spectrum of concern, it, it all relates to the same underlying premise of we just have a really bad uh, model for local transportation. I'm not talking about interstate highways. I'm talking about the transportation within our cities. And so this book uses Springfield as a device to explain that, uh, hopefully in a way. Uh, I, I found that when I talk about Brainerd, it resonates with everybody except people in Brainerd. <laughs> when I talk about Springfield, it resonates with everybody except people in Springfield because you get very defensive, you know all the new. I, I wanted to write a book that would resonate with everybody and everybody could see their own community and their own struggles in it. Yeah. Um, but then hopefully also have positive things result for a city that I, I care about, that being Springfield, Massachusetts. Yeah. One of our uh, uh, viewers here uh, added a, a comment here. Is, is just wanted to, to say Chuck's book, the latest book, has really changed the way I see cities, especially the words Road. And now, unfortunately, I see them everywhere. And, yeah. uh, and he actually lives in Finland. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. They're I, everywhere. It's a they're it's a US export. Yes. And I apologize for that. Yeah. I, I do I do uh feel uh regret and re maybe regret is the wrong word because I would do it again. I, I, I do lament the fact that I walked around for many years looking at these things and they bothered me, the strode condition, the idea right. that we would at the simultaneously try to move cars very, very quickly while we also created a place adjacent to that. Right. Um, we would try to do two things at once and, you know, fail at, fail at both of them. Um, this, this was something where I would, I would drive my wife crazy because we would, we would go on vacation and I'd be like, I can't believe what they've done here. Like, look at this. Um, and I would point all of these things and, and, and in my own town, I would write about them. I'd talk about them and I'd, I'd try to get our cities to, to change these. Um, when I started writing about the Strode, uh, I, I, it did have this effect on people where in a sense, you're explaining to them the thing that lies in front of them in plain sight, but that they don't pay attention to. They've just learned to tolerate or live with or accept. And once you give it a word and a definition and explain why it's screwed up, uh, they can't unsee it. Yeah. And it becomes very painful for people because l literally uh, you take a city like mine, 95% of our, our transportation infrastructure is one version or another of a strode. Right. Uh, where we're trying to do two things at once. We're trying to move vehicles quickly and we're trying to create wealth and, 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 and a place. Um, those things are not compatible, um, but that is the default way we build things. So, yeah. I, you're, you're dancing around the, the, the definition of this road. The futon of transportation. Um, I, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I do so much public speaking um, that, you know, especially in the early days when I was speaking to groups of two and three, like literally that's what I did for, you know, the, the first three years of Strong Towns is if anybody would listen, I would show up and talk. Like, yeah. do you want to talk? Yeah, come and talk. I would show up. There'd be two people there. I'd be like, let's do this. Um, you get to try out a lot of phrasing, right? And uh, when you're standing up in front of a group, things come out of your head that you 
you weren't anticipating. And one day uh, I was trying to explain a strode succinctly and I was working through it. And then I just said, it's, it's, it's like a futon. It's like the futon of transportation. You take a futon, which is uncomfortable couch, trying to be an uncomfortable bed <laughs> right. and it doesn't do either well. And the strode tries to be both street and road at the same time and it fails at both. Yeah. And I saw the light bulbs go off. I saw people like, okay, th that resonates with me, like I get it. And so, yeah, it's the, it's the futon of transportation. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it tries to do a lot of stuff and it does nothing well. Transportation for America just put out their latest uh, Dangerous by Design report and that, that that was the strongest uh statement i've ever seen correlating uh fatalities with strode design and they made that case i mean they they had the data and they, i can't remember what the number was but it was a really high percentage like 80 percent or something very 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 high of deaths are occurring on these what engineers would call arterial roadways yeah. um, where you combine high speed through traffic with the complexity of an urban environment. So you have cars that are turning uh, in and out of traffic, are stopping to park. You have people trying to cross on foot, on bike and wheelchair. When you combine high speeds with complexity, any mistake that you make, and we're human, humans will make mistakes. I wanna give you a, a thing. Robot computers are gonna make mistakes. A any mistake that you make in an environment where you've combined high speeds with complexity, it in a sense magnifies that mistake. And that's where we get our fatalities. That's where people are getting killed. And these environments that are actually simultaneously bankrupting our cities and making them lesser places, we're also killing people at the same time.